All right, welcome back. We are here with Brian Moore on another episode of the Gravity Podcast. Brian, it's great to have you on. Thanks for taking some time. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Brett. Yes. Yeah, so um, let's uh, start at the beginning. I want to hear all about kind of your your full life journey, starting with um, your early memories about life as a child, your family, your upbringing, your your environment, where you're from, all that kind of fun stuff. All right. Well, uh, so born and raised in Northwest Indiana, about a half hour south of Chicago. Uh, I used to tell everybody that I'm from Chicago, which ine- inevitably led to, oh, so where in Chicago, which then had to, uh, I had to respond with some long drawn on answer that, well, I was actually born in Indiana, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, but, but the town I was born in was about a half hour south of the city. Uh, so I had a lot of uh, Chicago orbit, if you will. Uh, my father originally uh, was from uh, Haifa, Israel. Moved here when he was 17, met my mother uh, in Gary, Indiana, and uh, they married in 69, had me in 72. I'm the oldest of three boys and uh, had really an unbelievable childhood. Uh, Had a really loving family, a very moderate uh, middle class upbringing, uh, and really started to find my way. I think, you know, uh, I've got a variety of memories, but the one that really stands out as kind of the the pinnacle experience in my life was during my high school years. Um, I was too small to play football. I wasn't very good at baseball. And I remember my freshman year of high school uh, during, you know, one of the very first PE classes, the swim coach took the entire class and we went into the pool and it was just a practice that the swim coach had. His name's John Jepson. And he would have all the PE classes, you know, do some laps just to see if there was any potential raw talent that was hiding that he had yet get got his hands on. And uh, apparently uh, I had some talent. And so he pulled me aside. He's like, hey, I think you should uh, join the swim team. And I told my parents I was pretty excited. And I did. Um, The school that I went to, little did I know, was one of the most competitive schools in the state of Indiana. And over the course of four years, went from a total inexperienced rookie swimmer to uh, my senior year swam in the state finals down at the uh, natatorium in Indianapolis, which is a pretty special pool. Uh, So it was a really great experience. And uh, the reason it was such a pinnacle experience is for four straight years of high school, we never lost. We were undefeated for four straight years. Now that had nothing to do with my skill or talent. It was the team I was on. It was the way we were coached. It was the love we had for one another Uh, And just our understanding of what it meant to be on a high performing team. And I didn't appreciate it nearly as much back then as I do today, but that was just truly, truly a special experience to Mm -hmm. never have walked back to the locker room on the losing end of a head to head swim meet against another school for four straight years. I mean, just really, really special. Yeah. Pretty cool. Let me um, just kind of back up with you a little bit. And I definitely want to hear more about, that experience in particular, you know, there's some themes that emerge and having done, you know, um, this podcast for, for almost three years now. Um, and, and, you know, I've kind of said this, our, our listeners will, will know that, you know, I've generally hear kind of these two paths from an early childhood, one being sort of this unconditionally loving, great childhood. And then, you know, maybe one that um, is more challenging filled with all kinds of things, including, you know, trauma and, and other uh, much more kind of uh, difficult paths. Um, Both seem to be very prevalent in the lives of successful entrepreneurs, probably just in the lives of everybody. It's probably sort of kind of how it goes. Um, But in your case, you know, you described the childhood part as great and, you know, of, of, you know, kind of filled with, um, you know, what sounded like, a lot of support and love and fun and joy and 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 whatever. And I just want to kind of like drill down on that a little bit more and, and have you talk a little bit more about that, you know, kind of prior to you getting to the pool and having the success that you had, you know, a lot has to happen. I mean, you, you're, you're, you're shaped in a way that has you, I don't know, jump in the pool to begin with and then, you know, perform in the way that you've 
performed and it sounds like you're being humble and that, you know, uh, wasn't about you. I believe you, you know, team coaching, love, you know, all that matters, but you obviously have some talent and skill there too. So just kind of back up a little bit and talk to me about kind of what it was like for you as a kid. And really, really, so people can hear, the parents out there can hear, you know, what it's like to raise a child or to be raised in an environment that you can look back on so, um, you know, lovingly. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I was really, really fortunate. I, I, my mom and dad who are still together to this day, uh, their anniversary is coming up. Um, so 69. So this is going to be their 53rd uh, wedding anniversary here on June 15th. Uh, so, you know, I had a gr- just great role models. They expressed a tremendous amount of love for one another. Uh, and there was definitely something too to the tightness of our community being raised in a Jewish household and attending temple, you know, multiple days a week and being in that community. I think I was just surrounded by people who are really there to take care of one another. And that extended into our home. Um, I was encouraged. I was loved. (laughs) I was disciplined at times. Um, And my dad was not afraid to bust out one of his old fraternity paddles and use it on my behind if it was necessary, if I was getting into mischief. Um, Mm -hmm. So that obviously kept me on the straight and narrow for the, for the most part. Um, And then having two younger brothers, uh, you know, I think there's certainly something to birth order. And um, I, you know, I guess naturally gravitated into that older brother, leader, protector kind of um, role, if you will. And uh, yeah, I just, my memories are that they were always there. We had dinner virtually every night together. My mom stayed at home and took care of us. My dad went to work every day. He was home by 530. We'd have family dinner. Uh, We would do our homework and, you know, we'd maybe watch some television, some Brady Bunch or whatever was on back then. And that was kind of life. It was a lather, rinse, repeat sort of thing. But it was it was routine. It was comfortable. Um, There were not many surprises. And uh, yeah, it's I'm trying to think what else I could share that would be really, really meaningful. Yeah, that that no, it is meaningful. I think there's something about kind of the lather, rinse, repeat, the Brady Bunch, the home for dinner at 5.30, you know, sort of the simplicity and kind of routine. And I think you said, you know, comfort, I'm hearing safety and security and, you know, things that I think are important for kids to um, feel and, you know, sort of embody at a young age that, you know, there's some semblance, there's some comfort, some security, there's some peace Um, that, you know, you kind of know how the day is going to go, Um, you know, and, and I could see how that could be very supportive for a young person. Um, And, you know, I'm also sort of curious, you know, you talked about, you know, being the older brother and and the birth order and kind of stepping into the leadership. Um, And, 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 you know, I want to just, you know, obviously you, you know, are a leader and you, you probably, you know, can um, demonstrate that throughout your life in a lot of different ways. And we can talk about that as we go. But, um, you know, I, I'm sort of kind of curious about how that uh, kind of felt at the time. Did you know that that was kind of your role? Was it just sort of assumed, implied? Did your parents tell you? Like, where does that kind of leadership um, piece start to come in for you um, as the older brother at that time? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm sure there were mentions by both my mom and dad that as my brother started to get a little bit older, that it was my responsibility to model sort of the right path because whatever it is I was doing, they were likely to follow. Um, And I think also at the same time, you know, admittedly, you know, for a short period of time, I was the only child. And then all of a sudden there was a second brother and then a third brother. And I think just to get airtime, uh, (laughs) Uh, I needed to be a bit more, um, a bit more vocal, a bit more animated. And I think as time went on, I continued to just sort of step up and grab a little bit more of the spotlight that I once had all to myself. So whether I was doing that consciously or, or subconsciously, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but there was definitely, um, an encouragement from my mom and dad to, 
you know, be the good older brother, set the right path and uh, recognize that whatever it is I do, there's a likelihood that uh, my brother, Mike and my brother, Jonathan, were, were going to follow suit. So, mm-hmm. um, but I never, it didn't feel like um, the, the, whatever that pressure was, didn't upset me or feel awkward in any way. Uh, mm-hmm. I was, I was a pretty good kid. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't get into too much trouble. Um, you know, once I got into high school and swimming, swimming is a grueling sport, three a day practices. It doesn't leave much time to, you know, go behind the school, smoke cigarettes with the, the rebel kids or get into drinking, uh, you know, at parties and things like that. I just, I, I really, uh, I took it pretty seriously. So I think, I think that helped a lot. Keep me on a pretty straight path. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. And, um, and let me also kind of follow back around. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, a lot of times these things are sort of just like as they are. It's not like it's some sort of massive like aha as a kid. I, oh, well, I better be a leader, you know, and then I'm going to be a leader my whole life. Like it just happens. And and maybe it's as simple as birth order or simple, you know, things that maybe you you take on because you heard, you know, your parents say one thing or another. I mean, it, it could be any number of reasons why you kind of emerge in that way. I mean, you could even sort of get spiritual about it and say, you know, it's just kind of part of your, you know, destiny or, or path in life to, you know, be a leader. And that started as an older brother, who knows? But um, let me, let me also kind of back up to the, uh, to the paddle thing, because um, it's sort of funny. I mean, the way that you describe it, you know, you're like, ah, yeah, my dad, you know, he got these fraternity paddles out and, you know, we keep us in line and that, you know, kept me on the straight and narrow. And it's like, yeah, well today, if you, if you, you know, paddled your kids, I mean, you'd probably go to jail, you know, I mean, it's a different world. Um, you know, when you and I grew up, I mean, you know, uh, paddling was a thing. Um, spanking was a thing. And so, you know, it was sort of, I don't know, it just kind of struck me, um, that you described it sort of like, almost like lovingly, like, you know, he, he was doing his job. He was keeping me in line and, and it did, it worked, you know, I don't know. Not that I'm advocating for abuse at, of any kind. I mean, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of kind of landed where it has probably for, you know, good reason. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, um, abuse that's just totally intolerable, but you know, the way that you described your father's discipline and parenting just struck me as sort of, um, I don't know, uh, loving. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. It certainly didn't feel loving at the time. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I mean, it definitely struck the fear of God into us. Um, interestingly though, I mean, to your point, when I look back on it, I don't know that I would have had it any other way. It was that ultimate sort of line that if we crossed it, any one of us, uh, myself, Mike, or John, um, it, the, the paddle was coming out and uh, he was not shy to use it when he needed to. Um, but it never, like, I don't know. It's just sort of this, you raise a great sort of point um, around how today that would be just completely um it's just shunned. I mean, we just can't do those things today, or at least the perception is we can't. Um, my dad often will talk about it with us and say he really regrets doing that. And I think he feels really, really bad about it. And I'm like, you know, dad, it, it, listen, we, we all turned out all right. Um, I think you were just doing what you thought was the right thing to do to keep us uh, out of trouble or to punish us when we did things that we knew were wrong. You knew were wrong. And that was your way of course correcting. And it worked. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't know what more to say about it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got two teenage daughters. Uh, I would never hit them with a pad. I would never hit them period, regardless of, of, mm-hmm. of anything. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's a different time and a place. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, you know, it is a sort of funny thing as a parent and we can kind of move on, you know, but I'm, I'm, I don't know, this is just kind of where we are at the moment. You know, it, it, it's, uh, I, I believe, I mean, you, you kind of described your father, um, and, and this experience in a way that I also kind of share a, a worldview of belief, which is that like, 
everybody's kind of doing the best they can. And um, most of the time, and not always, but you know, I kind of like to optimistically hold the belief that people mean well. Their intentions are not to like totally like you know screw up their lives and other people's. You know, I, I don't think people like set out to do that for the most part. I mean, you know, there's there's some bad out there in the world, no doubt. But um, you know, a, a, as a parent, I think you do the best you can. You think you're doing the best you can. Um, the world changes on you sometimes, and and you and you learn, you know, like your dad has that, like actually maybe you could have done different or better, but at the time you didn't know that, you know, it's how you were raised, it's how you are, it's the level of consciousness that you're bringing to life and to parenting. I, I can tell you my own um, experience as a parent. Uh, I there's things I would do differently for sure. From when my kids were younger, I'm a totally different father today than I was then. They would tell you that we've talked about it. Um, you know, my, my wife would tell you that, uh, I was raised in a certain way that I started to sort of model and, um, and, you know, not, not, you know, really, um, in a bad way. I mean, it, 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 I caught it. It was part of my path as a parent. And so I think that's the thing, like it's a journey as a parent and you might, you might uh, screw up, and again, you know, no, no room for abuse. Period. Just period. But um, you know, I don't know. I just uh, thought uh, there was something worth uh, kind of tugging on there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, it is something that has come up from time to time with my dad because of his recollection and just, I guess, some level of regret for having you know hit his three boys with a really thick wooden paddle. Uh, pretty ferociously at times. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the worst thing that happened is we would cry a bit and couldn't sit down for about an hour or two. And then it all went away. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we well, turned out all right. So, yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, one last thing on this, um, what it was like for you to kind of hear that your dad, you know, kind of acknowledged that maybe he shouldn't have done that and that he had some remorse and regret over that. I mean, you know, I think that can be a powerful thing by itself to kind of say, hey, you know, the guy at least owned up to it and feels bad about it. And, you know, and, and, and I mean, I'm going to come back and just, you know, highlight the fact that, you know, you, you described your parents as, you know, amazing and your childhood is amazing. So this is just one piece of a of a much larger, amazing puzzle. Yeah. I, I you know, I think him bringing it back up when he does is simply a reinforcing statement of that belief of that I had a really, really lucky, lucky childhood. Mm -hmm. That there was a tremendous amount of love in the house, and there's nothing that my mom and dad wouldn't do for uh, for myself or my brothers. And the fact that he kind of owns up to it and <clears throat> maybe has some level of regret or wishes that he could have handled things differently is, to me, just symbolic of that depth of love that they have for us to this mm -hmm. day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I. I I, I am a real, I'm so lucky to have the, the parents that I do uh, mm -hmm. really am. And the brothers that Good. I do, we had, we had a great family and so, still, and still do. Wonderful. And, and so um, let's jump back in the pool. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, and uh, you know, we, maybe we're swimming in the deep end there for a minute, but um, let's talk about your swimming. You know, I think that uh, sports um, and oftentimes for young uh, people. Um, and you know, when I was growing up, um, it might've been a little more focused on, on men as an important piece of, um, I don't know, uh, childhood development or, or adolescence. Um, today it's, it's, you know, sports are playing a pivotal role and, and, in our world and in all of, uh, uh, young people's lives, um, it's not the only thing, but it does come up a lot here that, you know, the experience of being on a team and um, working hard and training and all the things that you can learn through sports really does seem to have a pretty big impact on people. So, you know, you, you mentioned some big concepts, I thought, you know, some really important things about love and and team and, and you know, effort and passion and hard work and, and, and success and the joy. I mean, I just go ahead and kind of elaborate on that experience. It was, uh, I mean, I think 
I don't know that I could overstate the importance of that four-year era in my life. And and in particular, swimming, I think, because of its both individuality. You know, when you're in the pool swimming your your event, you're by yourself. The team isn't there. They, you know, you may have two or three guys in another lane that are on your team that are swimming the same event, but they're trying to beat you. And so in a way, it has this individuality yet team component to it. So I think in some ways it can be very uh, symbolic of what individual con- contribution on a, on a work team can look like. Um, goal setting, measuring progress, putting in the repetitions, swim in the laps to do it. Uh, oftentimes doing the things that you know, uh, can be incredibly grueling, but at the end of the day, it is going to lead you to a better outcome if you hadn't done um, them before. Um, so it's just, yeah. And that, and then the camaraderie that emerged from being with a group of individuals who were going through that same grueling experience. And I use grueling because it really was, I mean, where I grew up in Northwest Indiana, particularly in the winter times, you know, it could be pretty brutally cold. I mean, we're talking below zero with the wind chill, getting some lake effect winds and snow off of Lake Michigan. And, you know, uh, I would either have to get a ride if I didn't have my driver's license or I would drive to the pool at 530 in the morning and I would hit the water at 6 a.m. sharp, you know, before school started. And That water's cold and the air outside was even colder. And I mean, talk about a rude wake up call, jumping into a cold pool, knowing that for the next hour, you were just going to be grinding. Just, I mean, I I don't, I don't have words strong enough for the, the, how difficult our practices were and how much we pushed ourselves um, and how lonely it is. Uh, But we had an amazing experience and all that work was really, really worth doing. Perhaps in the moment, it didn't feel like it at times, but in the long run, and as I look back, oh my God, I wouldn't have traded that experience for anything. Um, well, what, what was it in the moment that had you still drop into that pool? I mean, I, I can remember, you know, uh, taking swim lessons when I was a kid, you know, you'd have to go to the, you know, Jewish center early in the morning and get in the pool. And I freaking hated it. And like, I was like, yeah, that's not for me. I'm not doing that. (laughs) I would cry. I would, I would, you know, uh, it just wasn't for me. You kept getting in that pool and, and despite the grueling, despite the, I mean, the, the winds come later, you know, the, 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 the hindsight comes way down the road, you know, the, 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 the reflective, you know, raise the hand in the air, stand on the podium, like that comes way after it. So tell me, you know, what was it about you or about your team or about this sport or your coach that had you be willing to do that work to have the success you had? So our mascot uh, was the seahorses, which is not all that formidable of a, uh, (laughs) of a mascot. That being said, um, there was a, it was, it, it was such an honor to be a part of the Munster Seahorses. I remember um, walking into the pool and decorating the wall. I mean, it is just this massive, like 50 foot high wall. I mean, you can imagine a big indoor pool uh, at any school. And the wall was just decorated with the leaderboard of every single event, whether it was the relays or the backstroke, the breaststroke, the butterfly, the freestyle, all the different events. And <clears throat> by years, it had like who was best. And so we were just sort of, we were engulfed in this sort of historical record of who all these amazing athletes were year by year. And you had, I had this experience that I was really a part of something so much bigger than just me. And I remember before every single meet, uh, whether it was a home or an away meet, before the team would come out, we would pound on the door. I mean, we would raise holy hell pounding on this door. And when we busted the door open and we would march into the pool area to uh, you know, for the beginning of the meet itself, we had a chant and it was seahorse country, no matter if it was at our home pool or in an away pool. And we, it was just, I still get chills thinking about 
how proud we all were to be screaming that chant as we walked in. It was this unified feeling that we've put in the work and uh, you're in our, this is our world right now and you're about to lose. And it was just this, maybe some of it was the adolescent energy of being, you know, teenage boys. And uh, we were constantly listening to, you know, Metallica and Anthrax and Slayer and this really heavy driving hard rock metal. So we had all of that uh, testosterone filled energy going, but I knew that I was just part of something that was bigger than me. And it was, it, it felt really good to be in involved in a community and a brotherhood of something that was just powerful and was all about winning. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I really loved it. Uh, there were mm -hmm. times that were, you know, again, the practices were grueling, but, but I loved it. I really mm -hmm. did. Great. Yeah. So let's, um, let's move forward and talk about kind of, then what, you know, you, you have this pretty awesome, you know, childhood, this incredible, um, you know, high level team experience. Um, you know, you start to, uh, move on with your life. Uh, do, do you, do you swim in college or what, where do you, where do you go from here? Yeah, I got pretty burnt out by my senior year and, uh, I wasn't good enough to swim in college or at least not in any of the Indiana state schools. I ended up going to, uh, Indiana university. Um, and I was, I was good, but I wasn't great. Uh, and so a, an NCAA career was not, uh, was not going to happen for me. Um, when I went to college, uh, <laughs> to say the wheels fell off the bus might be an understatement. <laughs> All of that, uh, discipline and focus that I had that swimming created guardrails for me uh, when they evaporated. Uh, so did my sense of discipline and structure. And so uh, I kind of got after it in college uh, for the first year, year and a half, which led me to not doing very well grade wise. And my mom and dad, uh, who were just, again, amazing and paid for my college, uh, decided that they weren't going to allow me to waste any of their money delivering the kind of grades that I was delivering because it was far below my capability. And so they uh, they pulled me back home. I went to the Indiana University Extension Campus, which was not all that far from where I grew up, worked a full-time job uh, in a restaurant uh, as a server. And unless and until I was able to get my grades back up to a minimum of B's across the board, they were not going to send me back to, uh, to Bloomington to uh, enjoy the rest of my collegiate career. So uh, they were serious about it, and I was really serious about getting back there. So despite a bit of a stumble, uh, I was able to course correct, uh, get my grades back up, got all A's actually when I was at home. And uh, then was able to finish out my junior and uh, senior year down uh, at Indiana. Uh, so that was, uh, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of stories in that college career. <laughs> Happy to go into them, but uh, I don't know if we're at a, an R-rated <laughs> show here. I don't know where we're at. Oh, well, uh, it's all, we no, it's, it's, uh, it's all on the table. So, you know, if there's anything important there you want to share, but I think, you know, the, the message that I'm hearing, which I think is actually really good for people to hear, is that you had some guardrails, you know, that were really built into this sport, maybe not even knowing it. You know, you you you're just kind of doing your thing, right? You're working hard, you're on this team, you're having fun, you feel the spirit, you feel the energy and excitement, and not even realizing that there's some um, you know, kind of uh, uh time limitations and and you know, your your focus has to be so drilled in that you don't even know what else is out there. And then when that goes away, um, it all becomes an option and it can be too much for people. I mean, I, um, I, uh, started to, you know, get into trouble, um, in high school, maybe because I didn't really have those same kind of guardrails. I was a tennis player, but like, you know, very different sort of, you know, fitness that's required and, commitment that's required. And, and maybe actually I would have been a better player had I <laughs> um, had a, a greater commitment, but, um, you know, uh, when I got to college, you know, it wasn't unfamiliar parties and, you know, whatever else, like I had, I'd been doing that, you know, for the last few years anyway. So, uh, and I, and, and I would see friends of mine that didn't, you know, that, that were pretty straight and, 
you know, um, not into anything in, in high school. And then they get to college and the wheels would come off, you know, and it was pretty, pretty drastic and obvious. So, um, you know, I think that's sort of an important thing for people to know and hear, like it happens. Um, you got to kind of find some balance in there, right? Like there can be room for all of it. And, and by the way, when it does happen, wheels really do come off. Uh, you can course correct. You, you probably need uh, some truth tellers. You know, you probably need some people around you to kind of nudge you at a minimum, right? And and or if not, you know, you're gonna have to figure that out on your own. But um, you can course correct. It sounds like you know that's what you did. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had help, uh, the external forces of, uh, Tom and Nancy Moore reeling me back in and, uh, bringing me home and making me get a job and get my grades up. I mean, I, I thank God they were there to help me course correct. I mean, mm-hmm. that I was just kept in such a, a partly by choice, uh, in swimming it was such a cocoon, uh, really just insulated from the outer world and any of the shenanigans that might've happened at weekend parties or whatnot. And, you know, going to college, a is just a, an expression of freedom to begin with, whether or not you're going to stay uh, on the tracks or not. So just that freedom plus then not having the discipline of the morning, the afternoon, the evening practices and finding so much more time. And then the choice of whether or not to go to class uh, after a night of partying, like just all of that expressiveness and, and choice, uh, being able to choose and you know not choosing wisely led me down uh, a path that uh, was not optimal and uh, course corrected and uh, it turned out okay. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty fascinating uh, little chapter and diversion in life there uh, for about a, about a year. Well, and you know, we, we probably won't get into the specifics, but um, I'm guessing that there was a lot of fun there too. Oh, that and, was amazing. Uh, yeah. And a lot of great <laughs> memories and friendships and, you know, I think it's important that we just, you know, talk about that for a minute, you know, because the discipline, the leadership, the hard work, the teamwork, all of that, you know, um, great. It's awesome. And like, got to have some fun for God's sakes, right? Like, and there's a ton of learning and growth that can come just by having fun, you know? Um, and maybe some of that sometimes means you're having too much fun and you got to learn that. But like, boy, you know, there's, there's a lot of joy. I mean, I, you know, I, my, I have two kids in college right now and I love seeing them just having fun with their friends. You know, it's like, that's the time in life to totally do that. And, and, you know, boy, it shouldn't just be that time, but it's definitely that time. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. No, I, <clears throat> the friendships that were made, the experiences that I had, the memories you know, at the end of the day, at least as I've taken a few more laps around life's track now, uh, the memories are what really, it's the thing that I cherish most are these experiences and these memories. Um, I keep in touch with a lot of the the individuals that I went to school with. Uh, it may not be super often, but no matter how much distance may uh, happen between the last conversation, we pick up right where we left off and we still feel like we were, you know, 20, 21 years old and having those experiences, even though we're now in our fifties, it just, it still feels, it still feels, you know, like we're kids. Yeah. And, and it's I crazy. love it. Yeah. It's nice. Um, okay. So I want to make sure we save some time to talk about what you're up to now, but, um, connect the dots, you know, you, you, you get out of college and, Talk about your career and kind of what leads you to the work that you're doing today. So I'll fly through it as fast as I can. Uh, when I graduated, had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, thankfully, I had some very helpful family members, made some connections for me. I started in the financial services space. I was working for Bank One when Bank One was still around back in the mid-90s. I uh, did that for about five, six years. Uh, I did well, but I just didn't enjoy it. It just didn't, it it wasn't fulfilling. And uh, I have to just we, interrupt you for a second because uh, I work for Bank One Capital <laughs> in the capital markets group. Uh, so uh, I always laugh when there's a, a Bank One alumni. Um, nice. And, you know, because, you know, most people don't even know what Bank One is. 
Um, but uh, uh, I also <laughs> did not like working in banking at all. So we have that in common too. But back I love to you. it. I love it. Uh, what, what's interesting about the bank one thing is at the very tail end of my banking career, uh, I, I had I went on a blind date. I met uh, the woman that I ended up marrying. We've been married for 23 years. Uh, and I wanted to get the hell out of the Midwest. I just wanted to see a different part of the country. Uh, I had convinced her that after she finished law school that she would move if, if I moved. And Bank One had two really big geographic presences. One was in Columbus and the other was in Phoenix. And mm-hmm. I ended up moving out to Phoenix. And uh, that's what got me out here and have been here mm-hmm. since 1997. John uh, McCoy. Yeah, John McCoy, um, who uh, I grew up in the neighborhood that he lived in and knew his kids. And um, yeah, so that's Columbus part. And then I think uh, I think they spent some time in Phoenix and that's how the Phoenix thing emerged. But um, I might be wrong about that. They maybe bought a bank or something. I can't remember exactly, but I remember those two cities being a huge, huge part of, of the bank one portfolio, probably still yeah. are to this day. Yeah, 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 yeah. So moved out here um, and then... You know, my wife, being as supportive as she is, uh, saw that I was coming home pretty much daily, just not feeling fulfilled, satisfied, despite the money being decent. She's like, well, why don't you just sort of control out, delete your career? You're early enough in it. You can start over. And so I did and was really, really fortunate to have landed as one of the first four employees at a job board that was headquartered here in the Phoenix area. And this was early 2000, April of 2000 to be exact. And started to get a taste of what it was like to be part of an entrepreneurial organization, uh, and especially one that was leveraging technology to really create a level of disruption in what up to that point had been the newspapers owning the employment classified market. If you wanted a job, you'd look in the Sunday paper. And if you needed to hire people, you'd run an ad in the Sunday paper. And so you had sites like Headhunter and Monster and Hot Jobs that were really disrupting that space at a national and global level. And the company that I had joined was focusing on doing the exact same thing, but localizing it, believing that employment was inherently a local activity, not a national or global one. And so I joined that company and uh, I was there for 11 years. It was amazing. And the real secret to our success was we hired people who fully wanted to be a part of our purpose, our mission, and shared our core values. And it was like this, this, it was like lifting the veil or the taking the blindfold off that, and no disrespect to the banking in, in industry at all or financial services, but I got exposed to the people side of the business. Whereas in banking, it was just more like you're you're a cog in the wheel. And if you don't work out, they'll replace you. And I guess there's some level of that across the board, but what we did at this company was truly magical in the way we hired, the way we trained, the way we really emphasized uh, why we existed and the values that guided our daily behaviors. And so it just, it really opened my eyes to a different way that business could operate. And since that time, it has been without a doubt, the turning point of, of my mindset of what I've chosen to pursue that you know, this notion that if your heart is in it, you're going to be a much, much better performer in whatever it is you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm grateful for that experience, which has led me down the path uh, that I'm at today. And there's been a variety of twists and turns, but recognizing that um, the system of capitalism, despite some of its faults and the shadows that it can cast, it's a really, really great system. And we've got to continue to elevate how our leaders lead this system and recognizing that, you know, this short term shareholder only mindset is, is one that has gotten us to where we're at, but we need to evolve into a long-term stakeholder centric way of making decisions so that we can benefit everyone, not Mm. just a few uh, with the system. And so everything that I do is kind of revolves around that notion um, yeah, let me let me just hop in there for a second yeah. because um, there's a number of things I want to just uh, make sure we touch base on um, talk about here the certain you know kind of uh, description of capitalism w- w- let's come back to that because I could not agree with you more um, and that's uh, kind of a passion of mine 
The um, I want to just talk a little bit about kind of the emergence of the tech. You know, um, people sort of probably don't even look at it that way anymore because um, it was like, oh, it's the internet, you know, but it was sort of massively transformative, right? You know, you described Huge. kind of the, the, um, classified ads. I mean, when you start thinking about not that long ago that that's how you looked for a job, yeah. that's how you found talent. I mean, it's yep. it's like shocking how antiquated and how far we've come. And I feel sort of fortunate. I, you know, we're we're similar in age and, you know, kind of um place in our our journey and you no, know, I um was at a bank when all that was happening, you know, and seeing this, you know, this dot com bubble thing emerge. I mean, it was wild in, in hindsight, especially. We're sort of seeing that again now. There's a whole nother, you know, web three thing happening. But but just talk a little bit about like what it was like to be you know at a startup, you know, in the dot com era. You know, I, I think some people sort of don't really uh even understand that or appreciate that, but it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. And I don't even know that I appreciated it sure. to the level that I can today, you know, as, right. as you even tee up the, the the question and wanting to pull on that thread a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh my God, to be a part of something so transformative to your point where, I mean, just looking at the pure economics of it. So for the newspaper to do what it did, it had to go through all of this crazy manufacturing process to print this paper and then distribute it with delivery drivers and newsstands and whatnot for it to live for basically a day, two, maybe three days, that classified section, and then to have to redo that every single week. Whereas we were able to approach employers and say, listen, you can continue to run that $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 ad in the newspaper that will run for a day, maybe we'll have a shelf life of three days or for a fraction of the cost and to have unlimited space, right? They were being, you know, there's only so much room on the, on the newspaper page and the more space you occupied, the more it costs. Whereas in the, on the web, it's unlimited space. It'll run for a month, maybe two and it's a fraction of the cost. And so just the unit economics of what we were able to do in terms of value creation was just mind blowing. And, you know, it was a real sort of lesson in habits and how hard it is to change people's habits, right? Because if you were an HR director or responsible for talent acquisition at your company, no one ever got fired for running an ad in the Sunday paper, despite how much it may have cost. But if you decided to not run the ad in the paper, which is exactly where the hiring manager was expecting to see it, and instead you ran it on a website that you didn't have delivered to your front door on Sunday so that you couldn't see your ad. And if that ad didn't deliver the right number of resumes or the right applicants, you know, if you're the HR person who made that decision, you might be in hot water for, for making that decision, despite all the economic advantages and your recognition that, hey, this may actually be the future of where employment classified advertising is going. And so it was just uh, kind of had this duality of, oh, my God, we're creating so much value and this is way better. And Wow trying to get people to see that is risky because it's not what everyone around them might expect them to do. Yeah. It was fascinating. That's a great point. I mean, I think, you know, that's uh, kind of been talked about quite a bit, you know, where you have the early adopters and you've got the people that like get it right out of the gate, but just, you know, the time that it can take for these things to really start to find their way into people's comfort zone and change habit, you know, that can take decades. I mean, and I think that's sort of what we're experiencing now with this, this latest tech, you know, VR and AR and NFTs and, and blockchain. I mean, I think it's sort of like not even debatable that it's going to actually change everything all over again. It's just a matter of like, getting it to a place that gets people to really get it and get comfortable with it. So let's talk about Anthem. I want to just make sure we, we talk about kind of where you're at today, 
what you're doing. Let's, let's, you know, kind of tease that out and, and maybe you can connect some dots for us on how you landed there and, and, and what you're up to today. Yeah. So, um, I'll share the, the, the quick story on that is back in late 2017, uh, I was just feeling a little stagnant. And so I made the decision to join an EO forum, which is essentially a, a peer forum of entrepreneurs and, and founders and CEOs who are interested in continuing their own growth, whether it's personal, professional, or a combination of both. And when I showed up to my very first meeting, we meet once a month. I was informed prior to the meeting that uh, at my first meeting, I was going to be responsible to deliver a presentation that is affectionately known as the lifeline presentation. And essentially what it is, is as the new person joining this group, I had to deliver the story of my life uh, in about an hour's time frame, which uh, can be a pretty intimidating homework assignment. Like, how do I sum up my entire life from birth to, to that date and time in an hour? And they gave me some guidance, but the biggest piece of advice that was given to me was, the more raw and vulnerable you are about the life you've lived, the quicker you're going to create a sense of connection, belonging, and trust with these other entrepreneurs that are in this forum. And so I really leaned in, jumped into the deep end of the pool and sort of bared my soul. Uh, all of the highlights, the lowlights, the regrets, the victories, the challenges, everything about my life up to that point. And what I found was, is my willingness to be real and leave nothing out immediately was like this, this demonstration of the level of trust that others could have in me. And in the months that followed at, at our monthly meetings, one of the other gentlemen who had joined prior to me, West Point grad, you know, military guy, engineer, very introverted, he came up to me as he learned about now my professional background in addition to my life story. He's like, do you ever think this lifeline experience is something that could be kind of uh, stripped down a little bit and then brought to corporate America. Here's you know groups of people that show up to be on a team every day. They see each other five days a week, eight hours a day, and they don't come anywhere close to reaching this level of trust with their teammates. And all the data that he was sharing with me that I've seen is like the higher the degree of trust, the better the performance of the team. So why don't we do that in the workplace? And this was in 2018. And I said, you know, I love the idea, but I just don't think at scale, corporate America is ready for this kind of an experience. And so we really loved the idea, but just never felt the timing was right. Well, we all know what happened to the whole world in March of 2020. This crazy chapter in human history starts where at a level of scale we've never seen before, everybody is working remotely, or at least a lot of people are. And so all of those connections, all the convenience of the physical office space that had been lost now needs to be recreated in a meaningful way, virtually. And so we decided if there were ever a time to try our idea, that would be it. So in April, May of 2020, we got a, a little pilot group of folks together. And the pilot idea was, could we get a group of strangers? We had about 35 people, bring them together on Zoom. Prior to them meeting, ask them if they would think about a handful of different moments or memories from their life that have been really significant, that have shaped who they are and how they show up. And in addition to cataloging those stories, five of them, would they also be kind enough to choose a song that represents each of those moments? So in a sense, building this mini soundtrack to their life. And our idea was that if we're going to bring people together, total strangers, there are going to be some folks who are not going to want to share moments or memories from their life with, with people that they haven't met. But as a way to potentially grease the skids a bit, we believe that music is a universal language that everybody can relate to. And so would music create a bit of an on-ramp for even the most shy or reserved folks to share a little bit more about their life story with people that they haven't met. And so we ran this experiment. That was the, the seed of the idea. And to a person, everyone came back and they were like, oh my God, I don't know how you just did what you did, but I shared stories with people that I've never shared before. And I've learned more about people that I've never met before inside of a half hour experience that I'm just blown away. And so there was really something magical about this unique combination of music and life stories that those songs represent that 
created the environment for what has been best described to us as like sitting around a campfire with your best friends sharing stories. And that's what led us to Anthem um, is this notion that, I mean, underpinning all of it, Brett, is the workplace you and I grew up in is largely transactional. Hey, come give us your time, your expertise, your talent, and we'll give you a paycheck and some benefits. And that's the, that's the deal. And I think while there's still a transaction happening, what we're all looking for, or many of us, I should say, not all, what many of us are looking for because of the just volume of hours, weeks, months, years we spend at work, we're looking for something relational out of it. It can't just be a transaction. And so because the leaders, by and large, who are running organizations today grew up in the same way you and I did, they don't know how to do relational at scale because it was never something that was part of their experience. And so layer that and couple it with this massive experiment that I think we're still in where a lot of companies are going remote first with geographically distributed teams. And you've got teammates that have been hired over the past couple of years who've never met their boss and have never met their teammates in person. They show up every day, just like you and I are right now on a video screen. And so how do you help people truly connect and build meaningful relationships when you don't have a physical space to do it? That's hard, but Mm -hmm. it's a reality that we're all being faced with right now. And Anthem as a platform is there to help people do that by simply tapping into their important life experiences and the inspirational media like music and televisions and movies and books and TED Talks that really shape us and leave those lasting impressions on our journey and using that as the ingredients to create a recipe of connection amongst people that really need it because if you're more deeply connected, you're going to produce better work. Yeah, well, it, it's also uh, fascinating, really, and, and, and incredible. I'm, I'm very uh, excited about what you're doing. I think that it's a combination of so many things, and, and, and that's sort of like um, what feels sort of new and like it has so much potential and runway as we um, kind of uh, shift as human beings, you know, the, the, the music piece in particular, and and we've seen things like Endel and um, you know, I mean, I just listen to music every morning when I journal or when you exercise, I mean, we know the power of the arts, right? We know the inspiration of sound and, and music and, you know, composed, uh, you know, lyrics, right? I mean, you, you think about the, you guys getting hyped as you walked into the, the, the meet, right? Like there's, there's some chant, there's some sound, there's some energy, right? And you're, you're tapping into that part of the body, the brain that, you know, maybe a lot of people, um, need to tap into, to be able to express themselves. So there's that piece, which I think is awesome. And then there's just the kind of connectedness piece, right? There's the reflective piece. There's the, you know, this, this podcast is sort of like a mini lifeline, right? Like we're, we're, we're talking about the parts of our lives that shape us and having some awareness around that understanding, you know, who you are, how you got here and knowing that about other people, the connectedness that comes as a result the awareness that comes as a result, the potential as a result of kind of understanding all of those things, I think is really uh, not just great for teams. It's not just great for corporate culture. It's not just great for leadership development. It's great for human beings. And, you know, maybe we can just kind of wrap up by, you know, you just expanding a little bit on this, you know, what I heard is like conscious capitalism. And I don't know if, you know, you're a part of that organization, but um, I am, and, and I love it, and, and I love the language, and you know, we're trying to build here in Columbus conscious communities, um, because I do believe, and, and I, I, I'm not like so uh, attached to this, I would be fine if it, there was some other great answer, but I have not found a better solution to solving the world's problems than through for-profit businesses, um, and, and uh, it just seems to work for some reason. But the focus, like you said, has to be on everybody winning, 
and um, everybody growing and helping and supporting each other as we try to collectively solve problems. And uh, that sounds exactly like what you're doing. There's a product that is helping human beings. It's helping organizations. It's hopefully helping organizations that are solving the problems that we need to solve as a, as a, as you know, as human beings. So anyway, maybe you want to just kind of wrap up on thoughts about capitalism or anything else that you want to share that we didn't highlight, you know, as we, as we start to run out of time and wrap up. Yeah. I mean, uh, so yes, conscious capitalism is very near and dear to my heart. I read uh, Raj and John's book uh, right when it came out. I think it was the end of 12 or beginning of 13. And it was, you know, kind of one of those eureka moments for me that was like, oh my God, this is exactly like what I feel. And it's been put into words. And um, that moment is probably right up there with, you know, my joining the job board that I did as a a really powerful uh, turning point for me or an accelerant of sorts where I got super involved. I was on the, the board of conscious capitalism with some amazing individuals for about six years um, and just have built some incredible friendships, uh, have been part of the Arizona chapter here uh, for a number of years. And yeah, I, I share your same belief that you know business, because of all of its uh, power, its value creation, uh, this voluntary exchange that you know as a business, you will be successful if you're actually delivering value and solving a problem that people are willing to pay you for. And if not, well, then, then the market will tell you and you won't exist anymore. It's, it's a very fair system that I think the challenge we've gotten into is some of the ways businesses are being led, particularly on the finance side and how Wall Street has um, you know, created this quarterly short-term mindset is just you know forced leaders many of them to make decisions and pull levers that are great for the short term, but really bad for the long term. And, you know, we need a lot more courage and a lot more long-term thinking in leadership to really maximize what capitalism as a system can do. And what bums me out, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, is that um, people immediately, if they don't understand it, will throw capitalism out and not recognize that it's a really great system. It's the bad, it's the few bad actors that we should be throwing out, not the system itself. Yeah. And, and I wish, you know, I wish we could help people really understand that. Um, I understand why people have the views that they do, um, but it's unfortunate because it's not the system, it's some of the actors. Yeah, well, I think it's sort of similar to the whole, you know, changing habit thing that, you know, we were talking about before. I think, you know, mindsets are tough to change. It takes time. And um, I agree with you, you know, unfortunately, you know, a few bad actors can really, you know, make it much harder. But um, folks like yourself and what you're doing and um, what you're bringing into the world, I think, are part of that change. It really makes a difference, um, not just, you know, kind of in the um, lane of your business. It, it makes a difference as, you know, a model for what's possible that, you know, again, everybody can win, that we can create products that um, employ people, that um, make a difference to the consumer, that then, um, inspires them to go on and do the same and, or, you know, have a happier, uh, healthier, better existence in life. Um, you know, all of that seems to really, really matter and, and have, you know, a big kind of wide, you know, um, you know, ripple in the ocean effect. So, um, I love it. Thank you for, for what you're up to and, uh, for sharing everything that you have with us today. It's been fun to have you on and, uh, get to know you and hear your journey. And um, yeah, thanks, Brian. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I, I really appreciate uh, the spirit of the conversation. I, it's, been, it's been a while since I've talked about some of those earlier memories. So thanks for digging that up and spending some time on that. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. That's a wrap. Thanks, everybody.